to, to take a look at the whole issue of gun safety and gun violence. It's been all over. As I mentioned earlier, uh, 2018 was the worst year for uh, gun violence in, in, since the 70s. Uh, I know when I was in high school, I graduated. I've been around a long time. I graduated in 1966, and that was when the, the Texas Tower shooting occurred at the University of Austin, Texas. First time I heard it. Since then, we've had Columbine. We, we've had Newton, we've had Parkland, we've had, uh, not only in schools, but also the Batman movie, Las Vegas, the, the church in Texas, the synagogue in Pittsburgh. It, it's really an out of control thing, but people are doing things about it. I, my own son was shot to death uh, you know, 30 years ago. And people get mobilized, and I'm so proud of what we have here on Long Island and in the city, and so we tried to bring together some of our local heroes to, see, to share with you what they're doing and what's happening. Now, we have quite a variety here, and uh, from uh, uh, you know, adults to young people, from as uh, young as, as high schools. But I wanted to start with our, with our youngest. We have here with us today, and as the, the district attorney actually gave you the whole history of the people, but uh, when Christopher Underwood, and his mother Natasha is here as well. So uh, thank you for coming. They came all the way out from Brooklyn uh, where he's in a charter school and has become quite a celebrity. His, he had the tragic loss of his brother, Akil, right? And uh, he's been speaking on the circuit. He's uh, won innumerable awards and he's been honored by so many organizations. And uh, our friends from New Yorkers Against Gun Violence said, you gotta hear Christopher. And he's really got an incredible thing to say. So I imagine we're all pretty nervous with 300 people looking at you but we're going to do our best. So Christopher, thank you for coming all the way out from Brooklyn. Thank you, Mrs. Underwood, as well. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hi. My name is Christopher Underwood, and I'm 12 years old and a gun violence activist and a junior ambassador for Miles and Man Action, Gun Sense in America. I am also a seventh grader at Eagle Academy, Ocean Hill in Brooklyn, New York. When I was five years old, I lost my 14-year-old brother, Akio Christopher, to senseless gun violence. I didn't just sit back and do nothing. I got involved because I had to be my brother's voice. Young black men are especially vulnerable. The chance of a black African-American losing a family member or losing a son to a bullet is 62% greater than losing him to a car accident. In fact, black men make up just 6% of the U.S. population, but account for 51% of all homicide victims. So it's important for me to talk about urban violence because too often it has been left out of the national conversation and all lives have value. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. It took a lot of courage and really appreciate it so much. Um, uh, okay. Now, you all, we have an incredible people, but as you know, and, and we're gonna, Linda's going to explain this, but uh, you know that with the, uh, the, with the Parkland shootings that we had a hero there, which was Scott, but even greater hero, which is his father, who's here, and his mom, Linda Beagleman Shulman. I'm not going to say a whole lot because she's a powerful speaker and she's been leading a lot. I also understand that the report just came out like two days ago from that, and I think one also from Newton. Which is, uh, we'll talk about that at some point. I'd like to introduce Linda Beagle Showman. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Linda Beagle Showman. I am not a politician. So understand that I will be speaking to you as the mother of Scott J. Beagle, my son. My 35-year-old son, whose 36th birthday would have been this past October 22nd. Scott was the teacher and cross-country coach who was gunned down and murdered on February 14th, 2018 at the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. It has been 301 days since my son was shot six times within three seconds from less than five feet away by a 19-year-old 
with an AR-15 assault weapon, a weapon of war. On that day, Valentine's Day, Scott was teaching his last class of the day. The fire alarm went off, and his students, along with all of the other students in Building 12, were heading out of their classrooms towards the stairwells. This is customary for any fire drill. This is what they are taught to do when they hear the sound of a fire alarm. But this was no fire drill. The fire alarm was triggered by gunshot residue that came from an AR-15 assault rifle. So now picture this. As practiced time and time again, the students hear the fire alarm and immediately head to the closest exit of the building. Now with everyone heading to the stairwell, trying to exit the building, gunshots are heard. Instead of immediately closing and locking his classroom door, Scott chose to go against protocol, and instead, he stood by his classroom door and began grabbing and summoning as many students as he could so as to get them back into his classroom, out of the hallway, and into a safe place. As he was trying then to close his classroom door to keep the students inside and safe, Scott was shot six times within three seconds from five feet away with an AR-15 assault rifle. Nothing can bring back my son. Scott was a teacher, a cross-country coach, a counselor, a grandson, a nephew, a cousin, a brother, an uncle, a son. My son will never come back to visit Dix Hills. My son will never see his sister or brother-in-law, niece and nephews. My son will never see his grandmother or his uncle, his aunt or cousins. My son will never get married. My son will never have children of his own. Scott will never teach another class, coach another team, spend another summer at camp, or laugh with his friends. I will never have another chance to hug my son and tell him I love him. As I stand before you today, I am hoping that we can make something positive come out of this. I am here today to talk about reasonable gun control. This has become my mission in life since February 14th. I am here today because I believe as a community, a state, and country, we need to put aside our political philosophies and differences. I ask that people on the right and people in the, on the left meet me in the middle. Meet me in the middle for the sake of all of our lives, the lives of our children, the lives of our loved ones, the lives of our friends, and the lives of our coworkers. Meet me in the middle. The middle is humanity. The middle is where humanity lives. The middle is the only place where compromise becomes democracy. We need to continue to have conversations about mental health so that all who need help will receive it. We need to take action so parents no longer feel a knot in the pit of their stomachs when they send their children to school each day. We need to take action so that our children will no longer walk into their schools with fear in their hearts, wondering where they may have to hide if an active shooter decides that their school will be next. We need to advocate so we can prevent another tragedy like the one in Parkland, or Pittsburgh, or Las Vegas, or Santa Fe, or Aurora, or Orlando. We need to advocate for reasonable gun control. We need to advocate for the enactment of the red flag law. The enacting of the red flag law in New York will help, was held up, I'm sorry, by the Republican State Senate. The New York State Senate Republicans are compelled by the NRA and its money. The NRA does not want to see reasonable gun control legislation acted, enacted anywhere. The NRA prefers to fan the flames of fear with the hope that people will buy more guns. And buy more guns, they will, totally out of fear. Human lives should be more important than the contributions of the NRA. Now that we have a Democratic New York State Senate, we need to enact Governor Cuomo's red flag law here in New York. 
the red flag law will save lives. After the Parkland massacre in Florida, which is a very pro-gun state, they enacted the red flag law and it has been used over 50 times. Maryland has enacted the red flag law and it has been used over 130 times. The red flag law, which is also known as the extreme risk protection order, will allow teachers, law enforcement, and family members to petition the court to take away the guns of any individual who may be a danger to themselves or others. This is a reason reasonable and rational gun control measure which addresses the mental health issue directly. The law will save lives. Please write to your state assemblymen and state senators and tell them that you support the passage of the red flag law. There is another proposal in Albany for reasonable gun control legislation. It would require that prior to the delivery of any rifle or shotgun sold by a licensed dealer to any potential purchaser, the purchaser must agree to have his or her social media accounts reviewed by law enforcement. This legislation allows law enforcement to check the last three years of activity on Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, and Instagram of the potential buyer. This will save lives. You may ask, why is this important? In Parkland, under Florida law, as it existed prior to the massacre, the 19-year-old shooter was able to legally purchase that AR-15 military assault weapon. However, if the sh shooter's social media history would have been able to be reviewed, we know for a fact that law enforcement would have discovered that the shooter was in danger, in danger to himself as well as others. If this had been done, the shooter would have been denied the ability to buy that AR-15 assault rifle that murdered my son. Let me share with you a couple of examples of why I'm fighting so hard for reasonable gun control. Some states propose and enact legislation which must first be approved by the NRA. Iowa is one of those states. Just recently, the state of Iowa enacted legislation which allows a blind person to obtain a gun permit. That's right. A blind person can now obtain a gun permit in Iowa. Another NRA favorite is to arm teachers. I am 100% against arming teachers. Teachers are meant to teach. What happens when an active shooter goes into a school and there are 10 teachers armed with guns drawn? First responders arrive. Who do they shoot? How do you know who's the active shooter and who are the teachers? Would they shoot first and ask questions later? We have to assist law enforcement and help them prevent senseless gun violence. We have to assist law enforcement so as to help prevent guns from getting into the hands of people who are potentially in danger to themselves or danger to others. This past Saturday, my husband and I were flown down to Florida where we, we received a briefing from David Bodrich, who's the deputy director of the FBI. Director Bodrich, the second in command at the FBI, has testified before Congress and briefed the president on February 16th, two days after the Parkland massacre. He was emphatic that the public must help by contacting local authorities or FBI and report anyone they truly suspect may use a firearm to harm themselves or to harm others. I say truly because of the ridiculous amount of crank calls that flood into law enforcement every day. I am not looking to ban all guns. I do have, we do all have a constitutional right to bear arms. I am fighting to save the lives of our children, grandchildren, husbands, wives, sisters, and brothers. I am fighting to save lives of our friends and co-workers. Banning assault weapons will save lives. Banning bump stocks will save lives. Limiting the number of rounds in a magazine to 10 
will save lives. Universal background checks will save lives. Closing the gun show loophole will save lives. Passing and acting the red flag laws will save lives. Allowing law enforcement to research a potential gun buyer's social media posting will save lives. I am tired of politicians who offer only thoughts and prayers. Thoughts and prayers will not stop the killing of innocent lives. Thoughts and prayers do not save lives. Thoughts and prayers come from politicians who only talk the talk. And now we must make them walk the walk. We have the power to force the politicians to walk the walk. So let's do it. Let your, let your elected officials know that you support reasonable gun control. Hold your elected officials accountable. After Columbine, some politicians offered only their thoughts and prayers and nothing more. This is not acceptable. Did those thoughts and prayers prevent the shooting in Las Vegas? No. Did those thoughts and prayers prevent the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando? No. Did those thoughts and prayers prevent the mass shootings in Aurora or Virginia Tech or Sandy Hook or Parkland or Santa Fe? No. How about Columbine or Pittsburgh or Charleston? How about just recently in a sh Chicago hospital or in Denver or in Thousand Oaks? Let us not forget that right here in our own backyard 25 years ago, we had the massacre on the Long Island Railroad. Please never say that it's just another mass shooting. There is no such thing as just another mass shooting. There have been 309 mass shootings in the United States in 2018 alone. 309 mass shootings. Just take a second and comprehend that number. 309 times someone with a gun, usually a military assault weapon like an AR-15, shot and killed innocent people. Those people were at schools, houses of worship, grocery stores, bars, movie theaters, and nightclubs. No place is immune. No one in Parkland, Aurora, Orlando, Santa Fe, Pittsburgh, Virginia Tech, Sandy Hook, or even on Long Island ever thought it would happen in their community, but it did. None of them will ever be the same. The mass shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas had thousands of victims. Scott and the other 16 who were murdered are not the only victims of senseless and preventable gun violence. So are their families and friends. So are the 17 who were shot by the gunman and survived, along with their families and friends. Have, ever, have any of you ever heard of Anthony Burgess? Probably not. Anthony Burgess, this is the New Yorker magazine, okay, is a student at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas who was shot and survived. He is a victim. This is Anthony Burgess today with his multiple scars from bullets piercing his young 15-year-old body. Anthony has scars all over his body from his multiple surgeries. Not only scars, he must also carry a colostomy bag wherever he goes. Anthony Burgess is only 15 years old. Other victims are all of the teachers and staff at the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School and their families and friends. So are all of the students who were in Building 12 that day that witnessed the carnage. And so are the first responders who put themselves in harm's way to protect the students, faculty, and staff at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. And so are their families and friends. Let me tell you about some of the first responders in Parkland. We were fortunate to have lunch with one of the first, responders team, first responder teams who entered Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School on that day. These first responders shared with us that they still, to this day, have nightmares. Following protocol, the first responders went into the school with their weapons locked and loaded. Then, in order to protect the students, they pointed their loaded weapons at the students and staff and yelled the words, hands up and don't look down. Hands up and don't look down. 
They shouted, don't look down, because they did not want any of the children to see the carnage that they would have to walk through around and over in order to get out of the building. The traumatic effect of the shooting continues today. Remember when I said earlier that the fire alarm went off at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School during the shooting? Well, know this. Every time the fire alarm goes off at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, the students and teachers relive the horrors of that day. Every time there is a bang or a loud noise, the students are afraid that there is another active shooter in their school. Is this the environment that encourages teaching or learning? Of course not. None of these people, nor anyone in Parkland, will ever be the same. The residents of Squirrel Hill, San Bernardino, Sandy Hook, Virginia Tech, Orlando, Las Vegas, and Santa Fe will never be the same. The point is that senseless and preventable gun violence has more victims than just those who were murdered. No parent should have to send their child to school with fear that they may not return home. No child should have to go to school in fear of being shot. No child should have to carry a bulletproof backpack. No child should have to walk into school thinking about where they should hide in case of an active shooter. No teacher should have to go through active shooter drills with their students. I did not celebrate Thanksgiving with Scott. I did not celebrate Hanukkah with Scott. I will not be calling Scott on New Year's Eve to wish him a happy new year. But I will celebrate the day reasonable gun control laws are enacted in New York. I will look up and make sure my son Scott knows how much I love him how much I miss him, and that his murder, no matter how senseless, no matter how incomprehensible, it will save lives. Thank you for having me here today. Thank you for listening. Thank you for caring. We will make a difference. Well, what can I say? That was incredibly powerful. You, you know that there's an organization called Parents of Murdered Children. I've been part of that for 40 years. And they've been trying so hard to reduce the carnage. But I'm sorry that it took so much. But I think you finally we hit the tipping point. So thank you, Linda, for that. And now, you know, what's really also good is that uh, millennials and young folks have been motivated and are rallying. And uh, I'm particularly happy because we have here Michelle Zaripas, who's a Hofstra graduate and comes from Newton, Connecticut. And she was strongly affected by the shootings at Newton and got involved in national and local activities with young people. Uh, she actually, at one point, asked to intern with the DA's office, and before we could say yes, she became the personal assistant to District Attorney of Suffolk County, Tim Sinney. Oh. But anyway, so anyway, it's, it's certainly my pleasure to be able to introduce Michelle Zaripas. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Tomorrow is the six-year anniversary of the Sandy Hook tragedy, which took the lives of 20 children and six teachers. I was a junior at Newtown High School when it happened, just 15 years old. That day, we all woke up and went to school like it was a normal Friday. But shortly after first period, our high school went into lockdown. We had no idea what was going on just a mile and a half down the road. My classmates and I huddled together on the floor against the wall. We didn't even start to think anything of it until we started hearing sirens, lots of them. And then came the sound of helicopters overhead. And that's when I pulled out my phone, typed in Newtown in Google, and just kept refreshing the page, seeing what was gonna come, come up. None of us could believe the news 
when we finally discovered the sheer number of children and teachers killed that day. I was convinced they had the wrong number. How could this happen in my town? I remember being in shock, and then I was just numb. I laid on the floor, staring up at the ceiling, not knowing how to feel. Once we moved into soft lockdown, we were able to move about the school, but we could only leave if our parents were there to pick us up. Some teachers put on the news, and others didn't know what to do. Thankfully, my mom only worked five minutes from the school, so she came to pick me up almost immediately. Once she got there, she jumped out of the car and hugged me for a really long time. I didn't want to let go, but the helicopter zooming overhead made me really anxious, and I just wanted to go home as fast as possible. The days afterward are a complete blur. I didn't want to watch the news, but the story was everywhere. I had family from as far as Peru reach out to me and ask if I was okay. My small, close-knit community that no one knew was now making headlines across the world, and to this day, we continue to be a statistic. On another name on a list that continues to grow, and we're part of a club that no one wants to be part of. When we all went back to school the following Monday, there were news crews lined up across the street to film us. They, and they remained in our town for a couple weeks following, watching how we dealt with everything. Our first day back, we had a school-wide assembly. They told us that for the next week or so, we would take it slow. And there were counselors available at any time to of the day if we needed someone to talk to. And a regular curriculum would be put off for a while. So my classes mainly consisted of doing arts and crafts, <laughs> like making paper snowflakes and coloring. But what really helped me through those first few days <laughs> were actually the therapy dogs. There were probably about 20 to 30 therapy dogs roaming around our school just available for us to hang out with. And I spent a lot of time with them amazed at the fact that they actually made me feel better. These dogs just came in and absorbed our sadness, and you could see how exhausted they were at the end of the day. Like, they literally just laid there and did nothing. <laughs> and it took a long time for us to establish a new kind of normal. Our principals and administrators were constantly checking in on us. And one quote that I'll never forget that my former principal said, was that our collective strength and resilience would serve as an example to the rest of the world. At the time, I didn't realize how much our tragedy affected the world. But little by little, I started to learn. If you've experienced a tragedy in your lifetime, then I'm sure you're aware of the distinct contrast in how you perceive things before and after. Afterward, it feels like nothing will ever be the same, and in a lot of ways, it won't. We'll never get back those lives that we lost that day, and my town, new town, will never be forgotten. Just like Thousand Oaks, Pittsburgh, Parkland, Santa Fe, Orlando, Virginia Tech, Columbine, and so many more. The shooting completely changed my community, like every community that has been affected by one. It woke people up to the senseless gun violence that we experience far too frequently in the US. Sandy Hook could have been any town. But one of the most important lessons I learned from it was the importance of speaking out, making sure my voice was heard in order to create positive change. It also taught me that we can choose love. The love for my friends and family is what drove me to fight for safer gun laws in our country and has guided me through my entire life, which I honestly didn't even realize until I started writing this speech. After the tragedy, I joined the Junior Newtown Action Alliance and went to DC several times with other students and adults from my town to lobby for safer gun laws. We specifically ab advocated for the passage of the Mansion Toomey Amendment, which would have expanded background checks and improved our national instant criminal background check system. 
We met with Senators Heidi Heitkamp and Dean Heller to tell them our stories. The meeting wasn't about throwing out facts and figures, it was about connecting with them emotionally. You could even see the shift in the conversation when there were students in the room compared to when there were adults. We didn't want more people to experience the same pain that we had all felt. But unfortunately, the amendment was defeated. It felt like a major loss at the time and showed me that we had a long fight ahead of us. We had to change our messaging around gun control. Our goal was to make sure that guns didn't fall into the wrong hands, like criminals, domestic abusers, and those with mental illnesses, not to take them away from law-abiding citizens. So we moved forward, focusing on fighting for safer gun laws at the state level, and little by little, we've started to change the culture around gun control. Besides lobbying, the Junior Newtown Action Alliance had the opportunity to send to attend summits at the Center for American Progress in Washington, DC, a progressive think tank. They taught us how to grow our gun violence prevention organization and spread our message. These summits led us to plan our very own Connecticut Youth Leadership Summit on gun violence prevention. I worked on researching potential speakers and organizing the various breakout sessions at the event. Some of the speakers included Colin Goddard, a survivor of, of the Virginia Tech shooting, Dante Berry, the co-founder for the Million Hoodies Movement for Justice, established in response to the death of Trayvon Martin, and Jamira Burley, an activist previously named as a White House champion of change. Our purpose was to educate our fellow classmates and to provide a safe space where we could reflect on our experiences through poetry, music, and story exchanges. We talked to each other, we talked to others who had been affected by gun violence, but on a day-to-day -day basis, like the Harlem Snug, which spells guns backwards. The event unified our communities because it showed how everyone can be affected by gun violence. We were able to get a taste for what it was like to walk in each other's shoes and see that gun violence is a much bigger issue in our society than we had known. In addition to the Newtown Action Alliance, I was on the Ben's Lighthouse Committee, which focused on providing programs to the youth in my town that would foster empathy and self-awareness. We organized the first Lighthouse Festival, honoring Ben Wheeler and the other children lost in the tragedy. The festival was in June 2013, only six months after the tragedy. I helped plan the workshops that we had at the event, which included arts and crafts, musical therapy, acting ses sessions, and performances by Newtown residents. We wanted to provide a safe space in which the children in our town could simply have fun. I even assisted in building a 20-foot lighthouse, which included six sides and 20 stained glass windows to rep represent those lost. The kids were able to write on the base of it with the main message saying to be kind, choose love, and stay strong, Newtown. Those phrases really resonated with my community after the tragedy, and they've stayed with me ever since. The organization also planned trips to help rebuild other communities across the US. I went on a week-long trip to Colorado where we helped residents rebuild after the 2013 floods. We also had the opportunity to meet survivors of the Columbine and Aurora movie theater shootings. We were able to share our own stories and it was a great way to learn about the process of healing and what to expect. It really helped being able to relate to the many others affected by gun violence. And they created their own organization called the Rebels Project, which I'm still a part of on Facebook. To this day, it is used as a platform to check in with one another and provide guidance to those struggling. It has really helped me to see that I'm not alone in how I feel. I would not be where I am today were it not for the love and support of my family and community. They have taught me the importance of using my voice and to not be afraid of being judged. Hofstra also changed me and is the reason I'm currently working for the Suffolk County DA's office. Being able to double, double major in political science and drama was one of the main reasons I attended, because I was able to do the things I loved most. And as we all know, there's a lot of drama in politics. <laughs> it has been interesting being on the governmental side of things now, especially for a county made up of 1.5 million people. 
Although I have only been at my job for a short period of time, I have had the opportunity to work on recruitment for the office, assist in press conferences, and staff the DA at events, and much more. I definitely had, have a lot more to learn, but I couldn't ask to work for a better team. And I'm excited to see what else is in store. Thank you. Our world is actually heavily staffed by interns from all over the place. And I'm a big believer in them. And, in fact, and we have a, a great staff. We have a, one of our interns is here today as well, Tara. But uh, Michelle, you are terrific. And I believe in you. And I think it's just um, absolutely amazing. Now, we also have another voice from, from youth. We have John Wilson, who just graduated Massapequa High School, right? With Officer John Groshans, who has worked with him. And the, uh, I spoke with John a little bit. He's a budding filmmaker. You plan to go into film after that. And you were moved to do something about it. Now, he's produced a film. We can't show the whole thing, so we made an abbreviated version. And uh, I don't know if, uh, if John, you wanted to set the scene and then pass it over to, we have two Johns here, John Groshans and John Wilson. Uh, my name is John Groshans. I work with the Flaw Park Police. Um, I know a lot of people in here. School safety is, is one of my key issues. Where we're dropping the ball is another key issue. Saying we're stay safe and actually being safe are two different issues. Um, some, sometimes we just go through the motions because it's not going to happen here. And, and we try to dispel that myth that it's not going to happen here. Let's be prepared. Let's do the things the right way. Let's learn from these past tragic events on not having it here. So when John Wilson, who I work with his dad, showed me this video, I have to tell you, it, it was extremely well made. It was unbelievable on both sides, not just school safety, mental health issue. You covered a lot in 20 minutes. Uh, I was very honored to be asked to be part of it. So I, I, I guess the thought process would be, how would you get started on a project like this? Um, well, it's working. Um, well, I was originally going to do something about like mental health and how it was originally portrayed, and I was thinking about it in February. Then, unfortunately, the event in Parkland happened, so I decided um, maybe I should do something that it can reach out to a lot more people and have more of an impact. So I decided to try doing on like school safety and school shootings, and so I started filming in March in my school. Perfect. And and after Parkland, Santa Fe happened right after you made the documentary, isn't that right? Yeah. So we weren't too far removed from Parkland before we have another tragedy, and we could almost guarantee we're going to have another one again. And the, and the politicians are going to come out and say, well, this shouldn't happen, and we need to do something. Well, it's time to stop saying we need to do something and actually do it. it, it it's enough. This isn't a Republican or Democrat issue. These, these are our students going to school. When I go to some of these civilian events on how to protect people in, in offices and churches and schools, school is unlike any other venue. There's no other venue that even competes to what schools are, where, how many people we have contained. Anybody here who work in a school, I just want you to think about in between periods. Should have something happen right then and there, the utter chaos that would happen. Your, your four lockdown drills a year are a lore. You can do more than four. We do between eight and 10 in our elementary schools. We do them all the time. They are never announced. I never want them to think that, you know what, I, I thought this one was real, but the other one was fake. Because when it's real, we find out the mistakes we're making and we can correct them from there. Going back to the mental health issue, mental health plays a big part in most of these tragic stories that either was reported and no one did anything. Uh, most, most of these shooters have long histories of the police being contacted and not having the means to do anything. Red flag laws would definitely kick in there. My problem with red flag laws, when, when you look We'll go back to the beginning from Columbine forward. Where are they getting the guns from? 85% are getting them from their own house. You, you had another shooter whose mom basically told everybody he's going to kill people, yet gave him an AR-15 and, and told him how to shoot, shoot it. That a red flag law would have came in. We could have taken that away. We wouldn't have had that tragedy. Did your views change on any of your, uh, the things you thought people were going to say and what actually came out of it? Actually. Kind of. I was surprised how many people were like for the change in gun control in my school. Like the teachers were all for it. Um, all of my friends and the other students I interviewed were for it. And I was actually surprised my photography teacher at the time, Mr. Salamone, um, he had an idea. He told us this when we had a lockdown one day. 
our photography room had another separate room. It was like a tiny studio that we weren't really supposed to have. But he told us that we had like a self-defense plan. Like it was supposed to be him and two other students would have like the light poles because you had to go around two corners to get into the room. So he, he would have like pikes basically to defend ourselves with. But he was for um, at least having self-training for the teachers. Did you think so many people would be pro-guns when you started this project? Kind of, but I was surprised not many were entirely for it. And uh, part of it, you see the documentary on their thoughts about having armed security of police officers in schools. Um, that was very pro too, and we'll see that in a second. Anything you'd like to add? No, that's fine. I just want to say thank you. You guys are the bravest people I've ever met to come up here and do this. And we all learn from everything and we move forward. So just thank you all. John's going to be doing a, a workshop this afternoon as well on the Safe Shooters. Uh, why don't we make it run? with broken hearts in yet another American town, which today became the site of yet another deadly school shooting. A high school in Parkland, Florida, became the scene of chaos and panic just before the end of the school day. The Broward County Sheriff says at least 17 people are dead. 17 people. Do you think teachers should be able to carry guns? No, not in my lifetime or any other. No. Uh, like do I want to carry a gun? No, I don't want to carry a gun. Just my coffee. Um, but I will, you know, I don't want to carry a gun. I'm a big believer in that schools should be gun-free zones. Um, we've had a, a, sto a new story where the lead story was a local high school on Long Island hired two armed security guards. The next two stories after that was a school resource officer accidentally fired his gun in a middle school and a school teacher fired his gun through a ceiling in a school. I think when we bring guns into school we now have what we didn't want and that's guns in school. That's a tricky one to go off of and I feel it's more like teacher and teacher based compared to teachers who are able to simply carry a firearm compared to those who can't. But, I mean, I personally wouldn't feel safe knowing a teacher had a gun if something were to happen. But I understand, though, that you, it, for the most part, you need guns to fight guns. So it's a, definitely something that goes case by case. Myself, I wouldn't want to have the responsibility. Um, I am pro-gun, uh, so it's not that I have a problem with guns. Uh, but the responsibility of, God forbid, an accident happened, you miss your target, you hit an innocent person, teacher, student, not something I would want to live with, not something I would want one of my fellow teachers to live with. So personally, I don't think the teacher should have the responsibility of carrying a gun. Uh, I would not have a problem if our security force was armed. Now they're all former uh, NYPD officers and detectives and they have an expertise with firearms, so that wouldn't bother me, no. Security guards should be able to carry guns. I'm a big fan of security guards. They work. They, they're usually very good at what they do as far as checking IDs, um, challenging people in the school hallways, outside the school, find out what they're doing there. They're very familiar with the interior of the school, the building, what belongs there and what doesn't. That's safe, you know, if they're trained, retired police officers, they know how to use a weapon, 
safety first. I think the security guards could have the guns. Like, I would feel safe knowing that they have some sort of firearm to stop something. I would be fine with security guards carrying guns. Well, I think we should have strict the gun control laws. I'm not sure exactly what those laws would entail, but uh, mental health is a big issue, and um, you know, background checks and situational, family situational, maybe. You know, those are all should all be considered. Sure. Absolutely not. Anybody who, anytime questions reality, should not be able to um, possess own, uh, even in their own home something that could destroy a person quickly. Does social media have an impact in general on students or when it comes to the question of gun control? When it comes to the question of gun control. Yes, I definitely think so because students are so attached to their uh, social media lives. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, th I think one of the stats I read from the FBI is before a school violent incident, 87% tip their hand on social media. Uh, those threats are going to be seen by the student body first, not by the police, not by the parents. I also advise the kids, when they, students, young adults, when they see a threat, they have a responsibility to stand up and tell somebody. It shouldn't be like easy for someone my age to be able to get a large weapon like an AR-15. It shouldn't be like that. It should be handguns to shotguns and maybe rifles for hunting. It shouldn't, like, I understand that you want to, like, there are people who want to have these guns in case of something happens to the government and they want to protect themselves, but the level at which kids now are able to get these large weapons shouldn't be happening. It's something that should be changed. I haven't really thought about why they react in, these, in this way. It's a matter of getting attention. If, if it is purely to get attention, then this is a very, very, very bad way to get attention. I'm sure there are other ways that people can get attention. Um, I think that probably the reasons frustration maybe with their social lives or society in general, the way they're being treated, the fact that they might not be heard when they have problems, that that causes them to act out in those violent ways. I don't think that it's merely a way of trying to get attention. Uh, I would still sleep well at night if I would have hit one of my students by accident with a rubber bullet, uh, but knowing that the other rubber bullets stop the person from killing. Um, it also it's a major deterrent, even if it doesn't stop the person instantly, it will buy somebody five to ten seconds to get around the corner, out the window, down the hall. Uh, but I don't understand why it's all or nothing. It's, it's guns with bullets that kill or nothing. I think there is a common ground that everybody could be happy with, and that's the non-lethal ammunition. Uh, stun guns, pepper spray. I wouldn't have a problem with 50 kids running out of the building crying their eyes out because of pepper spray, knowing that the perpetrator was down and out and we were able to subdue them. So yeah, there's a big area that we, we could find an area that makes us all safe without feeling like we're in a prison. What is this? I can't see you with ice cold hands taking hold of me. I am death come to excel. I'll open the door to heaven. Say, could you wait to call me to another day? The children pray, the preacher preach, time and mercy are out of your reach. I'll fix your legs till you can't walk, I'll lock your jaw till you can't talk. I'll close your eyes till you can't see the very hair come and go with me. Tallahassee now, the Florida State House, has just passed gun legislation spurred by the deadly school shooting three weeks ago. 
It includes new restrictions on rifle sales and a program to arm some teachers in Florida. The bill also provides new mental health programs for schools and a provision to keep guns away from people who show signs of mental illness or violent behavior. That bill now goes to the governor's desk. Oh, oh, Dad, won't you spare me over to Critics of the plan to arm teachers in the wake of the Florida school massacre are pointing to two separate incidents now on the same day where trained school employees accidentally fired their weapons. CNN's Miguel Marquez has more. Oh, death, how you treat me. You close my eyes till I can't see. You hurt my body. You leave me cold. You pull. Spare me over to another year. Spare me over to another year. 